Good morning, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us. My name is Tracy Perkins. I'm an assistant professor here at ASU in the School of Social Transformation, and I'm so pleased to welcome you to today's event uh, titled Cedric Robinson, The Time of the Black Radical Tradition. We'll be hearing from Dr. Joshua Myers about his forthcoming biography of Cedric Robinson, who's best known for his work on racial capitalism and the Black Radical Tradition. Dr. Myers will be in conversation with ASU's own Dr. H.L.T. Kwan, who is a student and a friend of Dr. Robinson and the editor of the 2019 book, Cedric J. Robinson on Racial Capitalism, Black Internationalism and Cultures of Resistance. After today's event concludes, there'll also be a virtual fireside chat for ASU students to engage with Dr. Myers uh, that starts at noon and runs till 1 p.m. And that event will be hosted by uh, Justice Studies PhD student, Tafari Osayande. Mr. Osayande's work merges cultural studies with the critical studies of carcerality, surveillance, and urban geography. He currently serves as the Associate Dean of Community Standards and is the Title IX uh, slash 504 coordinator at Rio Salado College. This student event will be held in a separate Zoom room. So if you plan on attending, please email Ms. Jeannie Colquette for the link and her email should be coming in the chat now. And we also wanna thank Dr. Mako Ward for helping to set up this student event. Today's event is hosted by the School of Social Transformation, the Humanities Research Institute and the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences who are all providing funding, publicity and administrative assistance to make this event happen. And we thank you so much for your support. This event is also the second of three Black History Month events hosted by the African and African American Studies Program in the School for Social Transformation. Dr. Mako Ward has already hosted a wonderful roundtable discussion on the history of Black protest at ASU. And if you missed it, you can find the recording for that event on the SST website. Today's event is also being recorded and will be available at the same place. And the third and final Black History Month event will take place next week. It will be a lecture by Dr. Lewis Gordon on freedom, justice, and decolonization. So please join us uh, there. Before we begin, I'd also like to acknowledge that ASU's campuses here in the Salt River Valley are located on the ancestral territories of many indigenous peoples, including the Akimel O'odham and Peeposh Indian communities. The history of colonization that led our campuses to be built here is always important to remember and is particularly relevant to today's event in light of Cedric Robinson's work on racial capitalism, which continues to generate profits from the devaluation of both Black and Indigenous bodies. So I'm very pleased to introduce today's speakers, Dr. H.L.T. Kwan and Dr. Joshua Myers. Uh, Dr. Kwan is a political theorist and an award-winning filmmaker. She teaches in the School of Social Transformation and her research centers movements for justice and race, gender, and radical thought. Her monograph, Growth Against Democracy, is a radical critique of modern development thought and policies. And her current book project, Against Tyranny, Ungovernability, and Tools for Democratic Living, explores willful resistance to various forms of governing. Through Quad Productions, C.A. Griffith and Dr. Kwan have produced and directed short and feature length documentaries, such as Mountains That Take Wing, Angela Davis and Yuri Kochiyama, A Conversation on Life, Struggles and Liberation, America's Home, a film about gentrification and displacement in Puerto Rico, and most recently, Bad Form, Queer, Broken, Amazing, a film about LGBTQ plus people on the struggle for economic justice in the United States. And as I mentioned recently already, uh, Dr. Kwan's the editor of the book of Cedric Robinson's essays titled Cedric J. Robinson on Racial Capitalism, Black Internationalism and Cultures of Resistance. So she's very well positioned to discuss Dr. Meyer's work. I'm also very pleased to get to introduce my former colleague from Howard University, Dr. Joshua Myers. Uh, Dr. Myers is an associate professor of Africana Studies in the Department of Afro-American Studies at Howard University. His research interests include Africana intellectual histories and traditions, Africana philosophy, critical university studies, and disciplinarity. He's the author of We Are Worth Fighting For, A History of the Howard University Student Protests of 1989, 
And as you can see, I found lots of good stuff to come back to later when I read it. Uh, this book was published in 2019 by NYU Press. You can get it at the ASU library. Dr. Myers serves on the board of the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilizations and the editorial board of The Compass, a journal of the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilizations. He edits the literary journal, A Gathering Together, and he works with the Washington, Washington DC area collectives, Positive Black Folks in Action and the DC Black Power Chronicles. His new biography of Cedric Robinson is coming out this fall with Polity Press. And you can find him on Twitter at DDHEWTY um, or find out more about his work at joshmmyers.com. All right, well, I very much look forward to our conversation. So uh, Dr. Myers will present some of his work first. Um, he'll be in conversation with Dr. Kwan about it. And then at the end, we'll have time for questions from the audience. So over to you, Josh. Thank you so much. Um, I want to just quickly give warm acknowledgement to Tracy Perkins and the School of Social Transformation and the other sponsoring organizations at Arizona State University for the invite uh, to come and give a talk today. The first for my book, which is now uh, in production, so it's not uh, quite a work in progress technically anymore. Um, and then to all of you students and other faculty who are here and from around the world, I don't take lightly the interest that has drawn you here and I hope to speak a little bit about that. Um, special thanks to Professor uh, HLT Kwan and all the Cedric people who may be listening live or will listen uh, to the recording. Thank you so much for your embrace. And the same for um, Elizabeth and Naja Robinson, Cedric's wife and daughter. So I offer first an apology. An apology because I'm not a historian and I would not be speaking objectively about Cedric Robinson. I'm sorry for anyone who still thinks that's even possible. Perhaps the work of a neutral detached observer on Robinson's contribution may one day emerge, but I didn't write that. For me, Robinson's life was an opportunity to offer a meditation on a black life. Yes, one who happened to be a scholar of black studies, a theorist and a thinker, but nonetheless a black life, a black person who for me, was notable because he was a black person living a black life. And who was notable as an ancestor who devoted his life to understanding that in that sense, I was attracted to this project because that kind of living, I believe offers something to us. So the book does address the main themes of Robinson's work, but I tried to do so by addressing the meaning of a black life, almost like W.E.B. Du Bois attempts in his Dusk of Dawn. Cedric's Robinson, Cedric Robinson's life is meaningful for me as a black person and his life is worthy of knowing just as Du Bois believed Alexander Crumel's life was worth knowing. Just as I believe my cousin Verda May Smart Grosner life is worth knowing or my great grandmother Edna Bowes or the woman in my maternal line all lives worth knowing and books that I hope that I could one day write. So this project became personal in that way. Cedric Robinson's work has been with me for a long time, but now I had something of his life to feel and touch even in his physical absence. So in this book, I think about intellectual work, but I also think about black life and what is worth knowing about a life that is worth living. What is worth knowing about a tradition that is worth embodying and what is worth knowing about being that is worth being. And all being is because of other beings. Cedric Robinson was born into a community in Oakland in 1940. And to riff on Fred, on Fred Moten, he gave the distinct impression of having grown up knowing how to be around black folk, which is not automatic for all black people. It was a kind of a grace he then extended to all other people. So I want to go into a chapter in the book called The Town and Gown. The town is a signifier of Oakland, one that came long after Robinson had been raised and moved away, but one that is now important to its people. The gown, a signifier of an elite education, one Robinson received at the University of California, Berkeley from 1958 to 1953. 
The first section that I'm going to read is titled, You Both Make a Truth. You Both Make a Truth. The spring semester of 1961 saw an escalation of activity, perhaps the most intense of Cedric's time at Berkeley. For Black students concerned about questions of the movement and larger global issues, the campus NAACP had become the place and setting for this work. Though they continued to organize and mount demonstrations, many in the group gravitated towards study and discussion as the grounds for their political consciousness. One consequence of this study was the welcoming of political thinkers to campus who had directly experienced and engaged in revolutionary alternatives being lived and practiced in the world. Revolution could not be simply theoretical, it lived and breathed, so these connections had to be made in real life, in real time. On March 15th, Cedric worked with the Fair Play for Cuba Committee to host perhaps the leading figure within the NAACP concerned with connections between local organizing and global revolutions, none other than Robert F. Williams, the leader of the Monroe, North Carolina chapter, and the proverbial thorn in the side of both the local authorities and the executive committee of the NAACP. Williams was fresh off his visit to Cuba. So Cedric and others in the NAACP and Fair Play held fundraisers to make it possible for him to get to Berkeley. On the importance of the Cuban Revolution to Black America, Williams was unequivocal. Quote, I had never known what it means to be free before I went to Cuba, end quote. Connecting the question of the Cuban struggle to the Southern Civil Rights Movement, he argued that his position as a Southern born African American allowed him the unique vantage to understand those humanitarian aspects of Fidel Castro's attempt to create an egalitarian society free of racism. Finally, Williams condemned the US media's coverage of Cuba's Cuba situation, which was analogous to the cotton curtain constructed by Southern media outlets, which offered a biased and untrue depiction of black life in the American South. Like Amiri Baraka, Harold Cruz, and others who visited revolutionary Cuba, Williams's visit has sharply intensified his understanding of the meaning and possibility of black revolution. Joining Williams at the event was a graduate student in sociology from Stanford who offered the liberal and civil libertarian position on the Cuban situation. While conceding that Castro's initiatives had raised Cuban living standards, he asserted that such improvements came from what he considered a less than democratic project. Though Castro clearly had support, the student expressed some concern that Cuba did not seem an environment where dissenting opinions could be heard. To these arguments, Cedric would offer a written response. Published almost a week later, Cedric's Daily Californian editorial began by championing the revolutionary move around the world to imagine a beyond to the Western world, a world he characterized as an anachronism. Williams' message of, quote, militant self-defense in the wake of the world's decline sounded true and clear to Cedric's ears, whose endorsement of Williams' program was shared by others in the audience. He then affirmed Williams' insistence that the posture of the, quote, tolerant black Christian has been too costly and a fool's errand, end quote. In such an environment, the application of Gandhiism was a grave error, quote, unless one happens to have 400 million expendable individuals on hand on hand, end quote. Moving to his central task of addressing the so-called liberals in the audience who suddenly found themselves in the throes of confusion, Cedric argued that the difference between liberals and leftists was, quote, the difference between those who wanted to change the world and those simply who simply wished to modify it, end quote. In light of the visions of freedom by these adherents of both democracy and communism, he emphasized the imperative to realize that, quote, these peoples, the Cubans, do not wish to fit themselves into the neatly carved places defined for them, end quote. Self-determination truly meant that. And it meant understanding that freedom required a world free of human divisions wrought by the ghetto, the nation, the race, stages that had to be passed through in order to realize the unity of humankind. What Cedric had gleaned was that Cuba's liberation struggle offered a vision of a future world not yet realized, and therein lied the fears of the West. But for those who saw in the West the source of their problems, that vision represented something to be embraced rather than feared. When news of the troubles that summer in Monroe 
reached a group, they quickly began to organize. Robert Williams, May Mallory, Julian Mayfield, and young people involved in the Monroe Nonviolent Action Committee had been involved in various efforts to picket the local swimming pool and support the efforts of the Freedom Riders. Those efforts were met with white violence. In the wake of that violence, several members of the group were charged with kidnapping. These were the trumped up charges that led to Robert and Mabel Williams's exile. In response, Cedric organized and became the chairman of the Bay Area Committee for the Monroe Defendants. Throughout November, they organized protests around the region to raise awareness around the case and its miscarriage of justice. At one point, rubbing up against the city ordinance in order to do so. After having been electrified by Williams that spring, it was the least that they could do. But they had also been shaped by other events during the semester. That April, Roy Nichols came to address the group. In many ways, he was woefully out of touch. This leader of the Berkeley NAACP and a staunch integrationist, Nichols was invited to speak on the burgeoning movement under the title, The New Negro. Instead, he offered the same old paradigm. And the campus NAACP ruffled the feathers of the local chapter when they dismissed those ideas. The students had become to the local Berkeley chapter what Williams's Monroe chapter had been vis-a-vis -vis the national. Signals came from New York to rein them in, especially after they drew closer to the Nation of Islam, a group that had also supported Williams in his program for self-defense. In the early 1960s, the Nation of Islam had begun to exert a critical influence in the Bay Area. But the story of how this all unfolded on campus is very interesting. On March 1st, Donald Warden, supposedly inspired by the nation, issued a challenge to the campus NAACP. In an editorial to the Daily Californian, he asserted that the student members had not only failed to commemorate Negro History Week, which we are in right now, but their focus on discrimination and segregation was less critical than the pressing questions of self-determination and national liberation. That ferment was evidence in the UN demonstrations protesting the role of the United States in the assassination of Patrice Lumumba in Fidel, Castro, in Fidel Castro's reception in Harlem and in the rise of the Nation of Islam. The NAACP's narrow focus on, quote, the securement of civil rights in the area was evidence that it had, quote, contributed nothing significant to our intellectual community, end quote. It was almost as if Warden was describing the position of the national office, not the group that was then not only planning to bring Robert F. Williams to campus, but also studying and debating the very movements he described. It seems Warden had not really engaged him on campus. Nevertheless, his missive endorsed the program of the nation before extending an invitation to a representative of the NAACP to debate the merits of their approach. The bombast present in this editorial might be attributed to Warden's personality. Graduating from Howard University in 1958, Warden came to Berkeley as a law student. He was both brilliant and charismatic. And as a former child preacher and debate team champion, he had perfected the powers of persuasion. But as was often the case with great orators, sometimes the substantiation for many of his arguments were lacking. In the case of Warden, he was often accused of trading in outright fabrications that sounded good and moved the crowd. Responding to the editorial was J. Herman Blake, who first refuted the idea that the campus NAACP by its very existence had limited the discourse concerning the best route to black liberation. In fact, he reminded the public that, that it was the NAACP that had invited black Muslim representatives to speak on campus. Many who are in the NAACP are close to the students involved were thinking about those, these questions and some even supported elements of the nation's program. A sophomore art student from Oakland named Nell Irvin, you might know her now, she's a famous historian, had recently argued in the Daily Californian that if people were committed to, quote, realizing that white supremacy has been an operating European philosophy since the 15th century, and realizing that this whole peculiar history has been one of separation and race before a country imposed by the white majority, they would see that for this majority to criticize the Muslims is hypocrisy, end quote. It was clear that many black students were not only aware of the ideological alternatives to civil rights, but that they were actively engaged in dialogues around these questions. Blake, who was well-read and well-studied, and by contrast to Warden, spoke calmly and clearly, closed his reply by simply accepting Warden's invitation to debate. 
The public debate took place on April 13th in Benjamin Wheeler Hall. In presenting the Nation of Islam's views, Warden argued that the fatal flaw of the integrationist movement was the middle-class Negro, the black bourgeoisie that was alienated and disappointed largely because integration would not and could not solve the basic issue of what racism actually attacked, their dignity. This psychological barrier to true equality would only be addressed through an affirmation generated through separate black institutions. Yet for Blake, the larger question of economic and political rights were nevertheless critical goals to be achieved. Grounding his argument in the Niagara Movement's declaration, Blake asserted that the fight was for nothing less than our full manhood rights. On the surface, it seemed to be the garden variety debate around integration and assimilation versus separation and nationalism that often reappeared. But there's also, there's also, but there also seemed to be something more at play. There was a clear concern and perhaps an anxiety around the question of how students situated at how students situated at elite Berkeley could remain cognizant of issues in the larger world around them, and to what ideological and organizational tools were available to address that world and the obvious alienation that they felt. After the two presented their programs, Blake encouraged the black students to join the work of the NAACP. But Warden curiously urged them to join CORE, despite the fact that the initial impulse of the debate was the Nation of Islam's program. CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, was largely populated by whites and had been active in Berkeley in direct action work going back to 1959. But it had almost certainly not pushed the nationalist sentiment that characterized Warden's editorial. Ironically, it was the NAACP that directly supported and enhanced the work of CORE during these years. Though much of the activity in Berkeley would greatly expand after the impact of Project C in Birmingham, students involved in CORE have participated in sympathy marches and sit-ins through 1960 and 1961. In the wake of the birth of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, a formation calling itself Students for Racial Equality, found ways to directly support this work financially alongside Slate and the, NAAC, and the NAACP, possibly through Cedric's influence, although they encountered struggles along the way. Warden's endorsement of CORE showed an interesting and confounding lack of awareness. Even more interesting, members of the Nation of Islam had actually attended the debate and were more impressed with Blake than they were with Warden the person that had argued their position. As a result, Bernard X, leader of the Oakland Mosque, began to actively recruit Blake into the nation, setting in motion Malcolm X's visit to Berkeley. The story which has become legend began in the wake of the April debate. Soon after their connection, Blake was approached by Bernard X with the idea of possibly hosting an event with Malcolm X later that May, to which he agreed. About a week before the scheduled appearance, the NAACP picketed the university's placement office for allowing United Airlines to recruit on campus, despite the fact that they refused to hire Black people for in-flight in occupations. Blake suggested that this was the only reason that he, Cedric, and Warden found themselves in a meeting with Chief Campus Officer Edward Strong days later in a fight to reverse the administration's decision to rescind Malcolm's invitation that it was retaliation for the protest might be validated by the fact that administrators had previously approved the event with no issues. But when the paperwork reached Vice Chancellor Adrian Cragen's office, a decision to revoke permission to host Malcolm was made. And so it is also necessary to understand this, this refusal amid the ongoing battles over speaker bans on the campus. One response by the university's administration to the Cold War environment was a revision to what they call Rule 17, which essentially stipulated that speakers allowing political positions would not be allowed on campus. It was designed to protect the university's nonpartisanship, but it was also clearly designed to placate the regents, as well as state assemblymen who wanted to curtail any political radicalism or subversive activity on campus. They realized how draconian the rules were on paper. When appearances by politically safe figures such as Adelaide Stevenson, fell under the speaker ban. And so relaxed under Clark Kerr's administration, which coincided with Cedric's time, the rule was changed to allow speakers on certain conditions, 
including one that opposed that opposing views were also presented. Yet these latter stipulations maintained the ban on religious views and communists up until June 1963. Though the controversial experience of uh, appearance of House Un-American Activ Un -American Activities Committee opponent Frank Wilkinson signaled that things were truly opening up, Cragen argued that it was Malcolm's status as a religious figure that warranted his ban. The two leaders of the NAACP, Blake and Cedric, along with Warden retorted that this was of course inconsistent and unfair, given that the university had planned to host Bishop James Pike on the very same day, and had previously hosted Billy Graham and Rabbi Alvin Fine, not to mention Nichols, also a preacher who had just been presented by the NAACP. While Blake felt that it was retaliation, Warden seized on the hypocrisy of the administration's insistence on the religious ban, arguing that if Malcolm's intention was not to proselytize, then he should be allowed to speak. Though Malcolm had previously been identified by the FBI as a communist and was clearly inspired by the religious teachings of the Nation of Islam, it was of course his power as an orator in the growing community of black nationalists that seemed to spook Cragen. Years later, he admitted that what had guided his decision was a fear of what, quote, his followers had done, end quote. What he was referring to here is unclear, but his, but his comments suggest that wherever Malcolm spoke, violence followed. Edward Strong remembered it, was a, remembered it as a courageous decision. Once again, Cedric as vice president took the responsibility of issuing a statement of response on behalf of the NAACP. Appearing in the Daily Californian on May 8th, the scheduled date of the event, the statement charging that the university's denial of Malcolm's visit was invalid and indicated differential treatment. Rehashing many of the points raised privately, Cedric pointed out that even if one accepted that Malcolm's intent was religious in nature, the university's allowance of other religious figures proved that their treatment was unfair. Cedric clarified that the NAACP's desire was to provide an educational forum for students to learn directly from Malcolm X, a privilege in many ways to witness one of the most well-known and eloquent representatives of the nation. And as such, the university's denial was, quote, fallacious. It was a university after all, Speaking for the group and likely not for himself, he ended the statement by declaring, the NAACP is opposed to the Black Muslim Brotherhood, but we can only express regret at the university's denial of opportunity for dialogue and discussion in an effort at intelligent opposition. The statement was shrouded in the ongoing battles between student activists and the university's preoccupation with surviving the Cold War unscathed. These battles were inspired by a strong defense of freedom of speech and for the expression of unique views, but often came down to a procedural and, techn and technical question. Universities' rules and their enforcement were inconsistent because they were governed by the ideological excesses of the era. Ironically, free speech was not meaningful enough to protect the students who wanted to discuss this very fact. Losing their battle, the students retreated to, YMC to the YMCA's Styles Hall, which continued its role as a safety valve for student organizers, especially, to, especially so during the speaker ban controversies. On May 8th, Malcolm electrified an audience that included the budding study group, the NAACP, and may have even included a young Huey Newton, who had begun to hang around these circles around this time. The campus newspaper sent a reporter who framed Malcolm's message as advocating, quote, the complete separation of races, end quote. This idea of separation was a preoccupation of liberals when it came to understanding the nation. But what could not be denied was that at the root of the nation's approach was both restoration and reparative justice and the psychological healing preparatory to self-determination. Malcolm made an important distinction between militant self-defense and violence and asserted ultimately that Islam preferred peace. Blake remembers that he keyed in on the contradictions of the students, including an interrogation of their apparent preference for white romantic partners, helping them to sharpen and refine their commitments to black liberation. What would become the Afro-American Association was indelibly shaped by this moment, particularly Malcolm's disavowal of the term Negro. 
Warden, by all accounts, was never the same. But in many ways, that became true of the entire group. The NAACP statement notwithstanding, it was clear that Cedric too was moving, was moving closer to a deep appreciation for Malcolm's ideas if, not, if he was not already there. About a decade later, Malcolm would become the subject of his first scholarly article. While helping to bring Malcolm to campus, Cedric was also facing his own future at University of California. A few weeks earlier, a US supported operation intended, intended to overthrow the government of Cuba had been launched. The Bay of Pigs invasion was widely condemned among radicals who felt that the Cuban revolution was righteous. The presence of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee had initiated widespread support of Fidel Castro's project among many students in the Bay. And for those who were skeptical, they at least felt that the United States should respect Cuba's sovereignty. Among black students, there was growing respect for Castro. In addition to the connection to Robert F. Williams, Castro's Harlem meeting with Malcolm X and engagement with the very critical and diverse wings of the movement was inspirational. So it was no surprise that Cedric helped plan a protest of the invasion on the campus. He belonged to a movement that went beyond just the University of California that had convened a major rally held in Union Square in San Francisco. Alongside activists like Robert Shear, Cedric was on the executive committee of the Bay Area Student Ad Hoc Committee Against U.S. Intervention in Cuba, which tried to raise support for their position against intervention by appealing to faculty at both Berkeley and Stanford, but they ran into resistance. The university's regents, the state assembly, and traditional media view support for Castro as ipso facto evidence of subversion. The rally at the University of California took place on April 18th, a day after the invasion. Speaking at the occasion was Warden and Maurice Zeitlin, a graduate student in sociology who spoke on behalf of the ad hoc committee. But the protest was unauthorized. University regulations required a week's notice to hold rallies. Cedric remembered that his response to this guideline was that the United States did not give Cuba a week's notice. So they could not have possibly been expected to do the same. Zeitlin and Warden were both given a formal reprimand for his troubles, Cedric remembered. He was given a suspension. Though he rarely talked about it, he revealed to those close to him that he had been dismissed. Unable to complete his studies that spring, he dashed off to Mexico. During this period, Cedric had begun a long-term relationship with Margo Dashiel, who remembered that the Mexican retreat had deeply struck him. This visit was facilitated by Kenny Freeman, who was then taking graduate courses in Mexico, but destined to come back to the Bay Area and initiate work foundational to West Coast radicalism. While engaging Freeman and the people of Mexico, he witnessed suffering firsthand and learned what it was like to live, what it was to live under the thumb of capitalist and imperialist exploitation. And it sensitized him. Mere days after seeing Malcolm speak in Stiles Hall, Cedric from the rural outskirts of Mexico City wrote a letter where it wrote, quote, a letter of love and despair to Dashiel. In that letter, he said, I have seen in four days more poverty, deprivation, and practical deformity of the human condition than I thought possible. The villagers of the Western coast are not indolent or inferior, but have been simply defiled to the point of becoming pitiful robots mechanized to their expecting duties and roles. The blind beg, not because it is the natural condition of the blind to beg, but it is expected and no other role has been assigned or defined for them. He wrote again a few weeks later to tell her a story of a young boy and his sister, both of them poor, cold, their clothes soiled, their eyes desperate. They approached Cedric to sell him chocolate. Of them, he wrote to Dashiel, quote, you remember the eyes. I've had to remember too many little wanting eyes demanding the luxury of survival. If your God exists, tell him for me and everyone like me, there is something rotten in this world, end quote. In this recollection, he also spoke glowingly on his conversations with people there about Cuba. He became deeply interested in visiting the island with Freeman during his dismissal and hoped to conduct 
a comparative analysis of the Cuban situation with what he found in the Mexican countryside, but he never made it. We can only speculate how that might have furthered his critique, his commitment to understanding this world. Dashiell notes that this was a moment where Cedric was becoming clearer, exhibiting, quote, a low tolerance for ambiguity, end quote. Liberation was no plaything, and it had to be seriously and rigorously pursued. He wanted her to know that the work that they were doing was meaningful, urgent, and necessary. If it felt like woe, it must have also felt like invocation to one's purpose. After describing the political scene in Latin America, he brought it all home. Quote, and yet all these things and more seem unreal because of a little boy a little Ray who was being told every day in almost every way, we don't want you and we don't need you. The marvelous and yet sometimes sad fact is that he doesn't seem to understand or hear even. He is reality and together you both make a truth. Cedric eventually does return to Berkeley that summer and addresses Slate's summer conference. These meetings were developed to allow Slate members to conduct workshops on pressing matters, both inside and outside the camp, Berkeley campus sandbox. Cedric presented a paper entitled Campus Civil Rights Groups and the Administration, which argued that groups that had been organized to support and protest questions of civil rights face an ironic attack on their civil liberties through administrative repression. Its thesis was that the university administrators, perhaps keen to protect the university from the quote, inevitable pressures of the conservative and reactionary pressure groups in the state, end quote, have resorted to measures that attack the very ability of student groups to conduct their affairs. And these administrative restrictions affected the very survival of this organization whose chief job of organizing the student body was compromised if they could not hold space on campus. His case studies were, of course, three of the actions that he had participated in that previous spring. The work of the Students for Racial Equality, the United Airlines protest, and the Malcolm X event. In the wake of the revocation of Slate's own official recognition that summer, as well as in foreseeing the events, the more famous events of the fall of 1964 on Berkeley's campus, Cedric's insight about the ways in which the university utilized procedural legal lease to conceal its politics was indeed prescient. And so I, I did have plans to continue to read on his experience in Africa the next year, but I think this might be a good place to stop. Just one year in the life of Cedric Robinson, 19, in the year 1961. And so thank you for listening and um, I'm, very excited to get, be in conversation uh, with HLT Kwan. Wow, thank you so much, Dr. Myers. Um, before I start, uh, I want to first thank Professor Tracy Perkins and Jean Collette for their coordination and footwork to make this event a reality. And of course, all of our co-sponsors, including of course, uh, AAAS, African African American Study uh, and the work of Michael Fitzward. So thank you. Um, I also want to acknowledge, uh, like Dr. Myers, all of Cedric's people joining us today. I know you're out there. I can't really see you, but I know you're out there. Uh, and not least of whom, of course, uh, is his daughter, Najda, and of course, Elizabeth Robinson, Cedric's life partner and collaborator, and my friend and mentor. Um, this is a community uh, that is Cedric's people, of which Dr. Myers evoked in his wonderful forthcoming book, uh, that I have the privilege of reading one of the drafts. So thank you for sharing. Um, Dr. Robinson, of course, spent his intellectual life nourishing us, this community. Um, and, and I hope he got nourishment from it as well. I know he did. Uh, so welcome Cedric people, always lovely to be with family. Um, so now Dr. Myers, <laughs> Josh, um, thank you for being here, but also thank you so much for your work uh, we Are Worth Fighting For is a fantastic work uh, and so needed. Uh, and of course, the forthcoming uh, intellectual biography of Dr. Robinson from Polity Press 
Cedric J. Robinson, The Time of the Black Radical Tradition. And I have to say, um, I'm a little bit biased. I really deeply appreciate uh, that you put, um, you center Black life and you center the Black community and you places uh, Cedric Robinson in the company of Du Bois and others. So thank you for that. So I, I want to begin with that. Um, and of course, this chapter um, that you, you and that you read from um, about town and gown. And of course, Cedric spent most of his uh, intellectual life uh, in presumably gown, in the academy. Um, how do you think he positioned um, this role differently um, than say other intellectuals that, that we could put him in company of? Also, by the way, I, at some point, I would really like you to comment on you know you you dwell on 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 the fact that uh, Cedric was very much part of the free speech movement uh, right. prior to the free speech movement, right. um, and 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 that establishes a certain kind of pattern of mm -hmm. Robinson's engagement. So let, yes. let's start there. Can we start there? Sure, sure. And, and I think the, the the first question is so is even connected to this, right? Because when he gets to when Cedric gets to Berkeley. Um, in the fall of 1958, um, you know, it was it was a Cold War university in many ways, and so uh, the Cold War had placed pressure on the university to sort of put some measure of control around expression, because as a state and public university, right, it was connected to the funding sources that were coming from the U.S. government as well. That's that's only one part of it, right? And there's also a, a, a tradition of conservatism in California, right? That we don't always recognize because California is like kind of posited as, you know, this liberal state, especially now. But it's also the state that produced Ronald Reagan, right? And so there's a there's a conservative strain here, and so the free speech movement first affected um, that generation in the late 1950s. And so they were actually organizing around ending the death penalty. And they were actually organizing around um, the House on American Activities Committee. These were off campus issues. Right. And so they they used the university base to really uh, be concerned or try to be concerned with uh, what was happening off campus. And these were mostly um, white progressive students. And so they founded an organization called SLATE, um, all caps, and it's not an acronym, <laughs> um, SLATE. And SLATE was basically there to sort of make sure that Berkeley students knew what was going on beyond the, the campus walls. And so their tactic was to take over student government. And in 1960, as they were doing that, you know, Cedric's friend from junior high school named Douglas Wachter was the one student who was called to testify in San Francisco at the House on American Activities uh, Committee. He was a Marxist, his parents were in the Communist Party and he was a Berkeley student and he was Cedric's friend. They lived, uh, the Wachters actually lived in black communities in Berkeley um, and Douglas Wachter actually remembered uh, Cedric as a 12 year old, 13 year old coming over to the house and talking about radicalism. <laughs> and so it's really, it's really striking. And so the free speech movement that emerged in 1964, there are two things that we must say about it. First is that one of his origins is in anti-communist repression. And two, the black students who were organizing at Berkeley, even though they weren't out front in 1964, in the early 1960s with the Malcolm X issue, particularly, it was a major, major front in their battle against the administration because race and anti-communism in many ways, you know, were part and parcel of this conservative strain of politics that really dominated the regents as well as many of the upper level administration on UC's campus. Um, I, will, will you finish? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so um, 
Thank you. You know, one of the things that's always very interesting, of course, about Cedric Robinson's intellectual work is it it ground deeply uh, in his community, whatever that might be. And I, I remember one of the things that he he shared with me a long time ago. Um, I think I'm I, I was barely toilet trained, but but he said, you know, as as people of color, uh, we then we are very good at building communities. We're very good at building surrogate families. Um, can you talk a little bit about the different communities of which Robinson was a part? Um, I know you share a lot about the Oakland community and also at Berkeley, but since we not everyone get to read your book yet, if you can give people a taste of these different communities that he was a part of. Wow, there's so many, and I'm going to actually try to try to talk about all the ones that I talk about in the text, because I think they're all equally responsible in shaping who he became. And so first we have to start with family, his uh, grandparents and his mother and his aunts um, were really important in his life. Um, their children, his cousins were also cru crucial. Um, the, church, the church that they belonged to was a major influence. Uh, the Seventh-day Adventist church uh, there in Oakland. Um, so that's important. And then um, when he went to Berkeley High School, um, there were many people uh, still to this day who remember him and his time um, as an important uh, ally um, in terms of building community, including um, a student whose parents had been um, in the internment camp, Japanese internment camps. Uh, Cedric was literally his only friend um, at Berkeley High School. Um, and so by the time you get to University of California, Berkeley, there are not many Black students. Most of the Black students are coming from uh, Kenya, in fact, uh, because of the uh, J because of JFK's program of bringing in students from the con African continent. Um, and so it's actually rare to see uh, many students who are actually from the area um, attending Berkeley. So I mentioned Nell Irvin, uh, now Nell Irvin Painter, um, who was one of uh, his friends, Margot Dashiel. Um, they were both local. Uh, black women from the Bay Area um, that helped, you know, develop that particular community. And there was also people uh, who came from other parts of the country to attend graduate school at Berkeley, like J. Herman Blake. Um, and so they would actually get together in the libraries of all places to hang out. And that was where they sort of hashed out the issues uh, that they were facing both as, as Black Berkeley students, but also what was happening in the movement world. And so that continued on. Um, you know, he is soon after drafted into the army, um, comes out of the army, and he works at the Alameda County uh, Probation Office where he actually meets uh, his wife, Elizabeth. And there again, they create community around how you deal with the question of the carceral, what we now call the carceral state, and its impact on uh, people's lives. They were actually uh, trying to lessen that impact. And so they became the face not of the state, but the face of community as ways of dealing with these particular uh, questions. Um, and so after they got married, Cedric goes to graduate school and um, well, continues graduate school, San Francisco State and Stanford. And then they end up uh, going to uh, England and then back to Michigan, where I think the next important community emerges, um, a formation called the Black Matters Committee. Um, which is basically, um, you know, black graduate students and radical faculty coming together and doing things underneath the curriculum, and then eventually exploding the curriculum fr from that underneath, from that under common space. Um, and so that lasted for two years, I think. And then um, at Binghamton, his next stop, it was the same thing over again, over and over again, right? And so there are many um, people that I talked to with the Binghamton connection. Uh, with Cedric as well. And so by the time, uh, you know, the Robinsons moved to Santa Barbara in 79, 1980, it was almost a practice of, uh, for not almost, it was a practice of going wherever you go, you forge community. And so um, their home was open uh, to students, to faculty, um, the work that they were doing to organizers, right? And so, um, what else can you say? It was, you know that that was a place that you could come. Their, off, their offices were open, just as their home was open. Um, and it wasn't, you know, always 
a question of people taking from them. It was also them taking from people. It was a reciprocal relationship. It was, it was a non, what I'm trying to say is a non-hierarchical relationship. Um, and that became, you know, a really important model. And that um, extended into, you know, what we now call uh, the, the, the model and practices of, of Cedric people. Um, and so I only met uh, him once, but I feel like I know him because of the way that you all embraced me. I could feel him through you. Um, and so community is, is really at the core of this because it's, it's also at the core of what the black radical tradition means, right? And so it's not about, you know, intellectual, you know, sparring, I mean, who has the best line or who has the best theory, who has, you know, who's most correct, right? It's all about how do you then perpetuate and, and re recreate space for black people to survive in this particular moment, which is all about community. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. I'm, 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 it's, it's very heady, that chronology, because we forget all of what you read was when he was an undergraduate, right? I mean, just this powerful stuff. Um, so thank you for bringing in the Black radical tradition and because we are living in a heady time. Yes. Um, and as a friend uh, and a former student of his, I miss him dearly. Um, although I, I do share privately with some friends uh, that in some way I feel somehow relieved that he has he has not had to put up with some of these nonsense because it's really a terrible time. Um, yeah. So can you talk a little bit about what are the insights, what are the lessons that we can take from Robinson, the community builder, uh, community builder, but also Robinson, the intellectual, the scholar, uh, that 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 we can extend as tools for living today. Yeah. Um... Hard, that's that's the hard that's that's both a hard question and the question right because you know when I was approached about doing this particular text that was the thing that everyone wanted to know right how would you know how does Cedric work Cedric's work prepare us to engage this moment of Trumpism um, you know which is shorthand for <laughs> something that we've always been dealing with in, in many ways and I think the best and quickest way to answer that question is that we've never stopped resisting. And to feel despair is to also, we have to also remember in our moments of despair that somebody somewhere is resisting the thing that's making us feel despair. And for us is, it's only a matter of joining that or supporting that or, you know, boosting that work. And that to me is one of the many lasting lessons. Um, the, 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 uh, the, the audio that's been circulating for a while now, um, if I'm talking at the Critical Ethnic Studies Conference is where I end um, the introduction of the, of the book where he says about the spirituals, the enslavers felt that the, that the spirituals were just noise. And so they didn't pay attention to it, which also speaks to something he always talked about in terms of the instability of these regimes of, of power. Like they, all, they are not in control, right? But they thought that the spirituals were just noise. And so they dismissed the spirituals or they're just coming from people who don't have any conception of, you know, how to, you know, engage in questions of, you know, deep thought or resistance. And so we'll let them have their noise. But the noise was instructions. The noise was wisdom. The noise was life. And so he literally says at the end of that you know, talk, he says, we have to just find the noise. If we can find the noise, then despair becomes a small thing. And the black radical tradition, what I love about black Marxism is that in that sixth chapter where he starts in the 16th century, he comes all the way to the 19th century and just goes and shows us story after story after story. And that's just a fraction. It wasn't, those weren't exceptions, <laughs> right? That's just a fraction of all of the stories of resistance that we are heir to. And so that's what I think he would remind us of, you know, that we have always fought and, we, and there are people who are still fighting. And so we got to join that work.
it's still urgent to you know clarify you know the states that are involved but people have always been fighting there is a tr there, as vincent harding would say there is a river <laughs> Thank you. And I want to say, I want to acknowledge uh, Ron Borglio for, for posting a question, but we must be on the same wavelength because I just actually asked that question. So I'm going to go now to Professor Tiffany Willoughby Harad, one of Cedric's people and one of my dearest sisters. Uh, here's the question. Thanks so much, Professor Myers. Can you say more about the legacy of historical approaches that are underneath the curriculum and how that relates to the work of Black studies defined as broadly as possible? Yeah, um, one thing about Black Studies is that we have always been open to listening to neglected or erased figures or figures who don't have the university or academic credentials that allow them to have to occupy the spaces that us PhD holders have. And at Michigan, Everybody that I talked to, with all, the first thing that they remember was not their graduate courses uh, with Cedric. It was actually the Saturday morning sessions that they would have. Again, not part of the official curriculum, but I mean, just think about this roster of invited speakers. Robert F. Williams addressed that group. <laughs> CLR James addressed that group. James and Grace Lee Boggs addressed that group. I mean, and on and on and on. Ann Arbor, of course, is not far from Detroit. And so Detroit was literally part one of the epicenters of black class struggle, to put it mm. simply, right? And so whether or not you know it was full disagreement with every all the tactics and strategies, the premise was we're gonna at least listen to these folks and have them be a part of what we're doing in this black studies program or in this broad black matters committee. Um, project because one thing is for sure you're not going to get that in your comparative international policies class <laughs> you're not going to get CLR James even though eventually you know what is beautiful about this is that Cedric does eventually allow them to some of them to get positions mm -hmm. uh, visiting uh, professor positions or if not that he was able to secure honorariums for them to speak right, That's right. And that that came after the students were introduced and then were able to make those demands mm -hmm. on the university right mm -hmm. beyond that there was of course the more um informal study group process daryl c thomas one of cedric's um, students you know really walked me through how you know they would go to you know the library or go to boat go to borders and you know they didn't have enough money to buy all the books that they need so one person would buy the book and they would just go you know xerox the copies of the book and they would just sit together in the library and read it to read it together collectively so i just want to say that because we yes. don't have a lot of time and there's yes. a lot of interest so if you can keep the response short because of course yeah, yeah. Uh, i'm greedy i will sit here and listen to you <laughs> talk for 45 minutes just yes. answering one question so the yes. next question is from professor alan gomez uh, and uh, the question he wants to ask is, how might Cedric understand solidarity or explain solidarity in an anti-Black world? I mean, I, I know how he practiced it. Um, you know, so there's the intellectual work and there's also the activist work. And, you know, the Robinsons were always involved in people who were threat, who involved in not only, um, talking about, but practicing solidarity with people who are threatened. Um, and that included uh, people around the world. And so when you look at the work, for, for instance, of Third World News Review, right, that work of exposing uh, United States foreign policy and other Western countries foreign policy in a moment where, you know, Black, a lot of Black thought was domesticated. I Meaning we want to focus on, you know, what's happening domestically. Um, in the 70s and 80s, they were able to really raise important critiques. And, and to me, that's a, an important form of solidarity, but there's also you know, the direct action um, mm -hmm. that he participated and his work you know, that he did in ensuring that the university did enroll on students and, and other progressive faculty was another mm -hmm. form of solidarity that was constantly part of their practice. And I don't, I mean, you know, we're in the university now, I just don't see that kind of risk taking as much, mm. so. 
All right, the next question is from Justin uh, Dunavat. Uh, thank you, Professor Myers. What was your most unexpected revelation from researching this book? Uh, wow, unexpected. <laughs> a lot of it is unexpected. Um, you know, as you all, you know, HQ and Elizabeth told me um, last March, you know, Cedric didn't talk about his life a lot. So um, he didn't see himself as the center, right? And that sort of made me have to go to a lot of people that knew him. And so I would say, you know, talking to Margot Dashiell and um, Nell Irvin Painter and so many people that knew him as an undergraduate student showed me things that I never would have known otherwise about his character. And I think that um, piece was really critical. And then, um, when, when Elizabeth so graciously allowed me to see the personal archives. I mean, it was just three days of discovering things that were just so foundational to his life that I just would not have gleaned from his written works. Mm -hmm. So just to keep it short, that, that's, that's how I'll answer that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the next question is from uh, someone who is Dial in from, uh, this is Greg Burris tuning in from Beirut. Thank you for this talk. I have a really easy question for you. You said that you only met Cedric one time and I'm just curious if you could tell us the nature of that encounter. Can't wait to read the book. Uh, thank you, Greg. Um, so his, uh, the conference that Jordan Camp and Christina Heatherton helped put together in New York um, was at 2014. I was an assistant, young assistant professor in my, in my second year and you know, I just decided to go because I didn't know, you know, when he would be on the on the East Coast again. Um, and so I went, um, and I learned a lot at that conference. But um, at the final plenary, I think Angela Davis spoke. And after that, um, you know, I went up to uh, Cedric and told him about my work. And he was clearly tired. It was a long day. Um, but he gave me in like two minutes a homework assignment. He told me, you need to read this, 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 and this. And it was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like Thank him. you. <laughs> Thank you. And then I went and read it and it was like, okay. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, so we have a question for Professor JT Rowan. Uh, wonderful talk and discussion. Could you talk more about Robinson's relationship to Malcolm? especially in light of his essay on Malcolm and uh, Charisma in HQ's yes. edited collection. Yes, that essay is really important to read. It came out of his graduate work at Stanford. Um, so he's reading um, a lot of different, uh, well, we would probably now call critical theory. He's just opposing it to traditional uh, political science work. It's really, it's really fascinating in that sense. Um, but if you look at that essay, it's not a praise song for Malcolm. Um, it's a praise song for the people that produced Malcolm and are produced by Malcolm in the sense that there was, a, again, a reciprocal non-hierarchical relationship between the follower and the follower, the followers and the, um, the people who are the leaders, right? And so he's working out this whole theory about leadership in that particular essay. Um, I don't know about a, if there was anything more personal than that, I do know that uh, Malcolm came to the Bay Area twice, first in 1961, um, and then in 1963, after they got rid of the religious ban, which is of course the work of Cedric and his group. Um, and so I do know there's a story between uh, Cedric's friend, J. Herman Blake and Malcolm, and I'm probably gonna mess up the quote, so I'm not gonna try to do a direct quote, but it was so, inspiring it was it was it was so the energy was so high in the bay area in 1963 at that time that there was real talk between them trying to convince malcolm to move to the bay area literally move from harlem to the bay area and malcolm was like i rather i rather stay in the street alley in harlem than come to california <laughs> and so they couldn't get him to move but i think the fact that there was this conversation was really important because we know very soon after, right, you start to get, you know, the activities of the Revolutionary Action Movement, which is, you know, which puts Malcolm on his, uh, gave a titular head to Malcolm, along with Queen Mother Moore and Robert F. Williams, there's the West Coast chapter of RAM, um, their soul book, 
then eventually um, the Black Panther Party of Northern California, which then precedes uh, the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense in 1966. Malcolm was huge in the Bay Area. Yes, yes, he was. Um, I'm going to, and I know there are some question about whether or not, or not uh, Elizabeth Robinson has a question for you, Josh. There's some confusion. I read the question that she posted. That's actually Dr. Tiffany Willoughby Harrod's question. That was the first question I think I, I, I read. So let me go Not to your hand. Uh, yeah, let me let me go to uh, Debbie Cotton's question. Thank you for this talk. What can the BLM movement learn from and implement from uh, Dr. Robinson's work? Thank you. Um, and Dr. Rowan said, thank you for your response. I just want to say we have about five minutes left before I was told, and I do whatever I'm told to do. Uh, I was told that I'm going to hand over um, the 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 speaker speak uh, the mic to Tracy Perkins. So. Yes, please. Well, you know, I think BLM would, I think he would ask BLM what they wanted, what they wanted to, to accomplish. And he would then sort of talk about with them um, how, how they get to that particular goal. Now, I can't, I really don't feel comfortable answering that question in such a short time because there's so many different evolutions and, you know, chapters and, you know, politics around uh, BLM broadly considered. But I think the very basic question and concern is how do you respond to and deal with uh, police violence. And I think the terror of the state is something that is a broad theme in Cedric's work and how the, the state creates, you know, forms of terror for poor people and for uh, threatened people. I think his analysis, of, his analysis of that in the terms of order and in uh, Black Marxism and other places as well, um, but especially those two places, I think he would ask them to engage that or maybe engage that with them. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, um, I totally appreciate your actually not responding because it requires another conversation and maybe we can bring you back. Um, yeah. But I'm going to actually, uh, and some people would say I'm biased, I'm going to uh, actually let Elizabeth Robinson ask the last question because she just posted. And she said, thank you for the presentation, Professor Myers. Could you comment on what or how Cedric would address the issues confronting indigenous people, settler colonialism, BLM, racial issues, feminism, and immigrant rights, and the contradictions. Wow. He no doesn't pressure. ask easy questions. <laughs> I'm sure you know that by now. No pressure. Um, so, yeah, thank you for that, Elizabeth. And the current manifestations of settler colonialism are at the root of the whole critique of Western civilization, any critique of Western civilization, right? has to deal with, with colonial, colonial dispossession, which you know, is manifest in all of the forms of settler colonialism um, that emerged. And so I didn't get a chance to read the Africa piece here, but Cedric went in 1962 to a place where both settler colonialism and anti-Black racism um, were, were joined in Southern, Southern Rhodesia, right? And so I think just to quickly sort of summarize he would see all of these issues as fundamentally intertwined and can't be disaggregated uh, from the very basis of what we're struggling against, known as the West. And the West is not just, you know, a political question, a political formation. It's also a deeply philosophical formation. It's a conceptual formation. It's, epistemolo it's, epi it's an epistemological formation, and that's where you attack it, and that's where you that's where you sort of glean. Um, what it is and what the implications are. And then you can then talk about the political implications that then we all feel and touch every day. And so that being said, I think he would, you know, definitely um, have a lot to say about um, all of the different forms of gender-based oppression, sexuality-based oppressions that are just manifestations of that same single, not single, but that, that basic uh, problem or that basic uh, formation of the West. And um, I do try to talk about this in the next book, uh, which also deals with um, uh, Cedric and his relationship to um, the concept of the West and how that influences what Black Studies does and should be doing. And so um, I'm going to continue to think about that question, <laughs> Elizabeth. <laughs> well, thank you for thinking about that question. Um, we are wrapping up. So as you know, I always like to ask the same question, which is, 
are there anything that you uh, haven't mentioned that you would like to add? Because I'm going to give you the last minute or two um, and, and before you, you, you transition to the fireside chat with the graduate students. Um, no, I think, you know, if there was anything I would like to add, it would, be, it would take another hour. <laughs> so I just want to say thank you again. And, um, you know, it's, 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 very, it's really something to have a book talk before the book is out. And that foresight is very, um, I'm very grateful for that. Um, and so I just wanna, you know, well, I do wanna say this. Um, this book should not be the last word or the definitive word um, on Cedric Robinson's life or Cedric Robinson's work. If there's anything that would make me happy about what I've done is that it would be that more people read his work and then write about his work, um, as, as opposed to assuming that they know what's in this work based on what other people have said. Thank you for that. And uh, I urge everyone to look for uh, Cedric J. Robinson, uh, The Time of the Black Radical Tradition. And I won't ruin the ending for people, but I really just love the ending, the, the before the postscript. So thank you. Um, yeah. Tracy, it's all yours. <laughs> all right, thank you, um, Dr. Kwan. Thank you so much, Dr. Myers, for the work you're doing um, that you've already done that's coming out soon. And I'm also very intrigued by the, the third book. Um, you're a prolific writer, so you know, you gotta try and keep up with the reading. Um, and also thank you, Dr. Kwan, for facilitating such a rich conversation. Uh, I hope that we'll have more opportunities to bring you two together um, in ways that the rest of us can, can learn from your experiences and your scholarship. Um, thank you again to our sponsors, the School for Social Transformation, the Institute for Humanities Research, and the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. If any of you would like to review this talk later, you'll be able to find it on the School for Social Transformation's Black History Month website, along with the two other events. And ASU students, undergrads and grad students, you're both welcome to join Dr. Myers and Tafario Sayande uh, in about 15 minutes at noon for some kind of unscripted conversation. Um, and I believe Jeannie has posted the URL for that Zoom room in the chat. And I also hope you will all join us for the School for Social Transformation and the African and African American Studies Program's third and final Black History Month event uh, next week with Dr. Lewis Gordon. You can register for his lecture, Freedom, Justice, and Decolonization at the link in the chat box. So thank you again, Dr. Myers. Thank you, Dr. Kwan. And I hope this is just the beginning for a lot of people of either first time engagement with Cedric Robinson's work or deeper re-engagement with it. Take care. Thank you, Dr. Perkins.